So welcome, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, I want to thank Dina for having us, inviting us um, to the expo this year. Um, we are um, Piscatello Law, and uh, we're a law firm in Center City, Philadelphia, that uh, practices throughout Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, we have a, a, a few people with us here today. Uh, we recently uh, developed a relationship with a um, very well-known, prestigious racer, uh, professional racer, Arlie Kemmerer. Um, she's going to be helping me out today. Um, we also have uh, Rachel Rabino, who is um, helping with our office. Um, she's a bike advocate and a, and a mechanic that uh, looks after us. Um, but we also have Marissa Perone, who um, tells me what to do and not to do. She's our marketing <laughs> director. And, um, of course, we have Andrea Paparelli, who's our paralegal, and um, also we're very proud to say a, a law student that uh, is someday going to be up here instead of me. So with, with that being said, what, 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 we, what we'd like to do today is um, talk about a few different, uh, a few different topics. Um, first of all, um, what we do and who we're associated with. Um, we predominantly represent cyclists in the community that have been in bike crashes. Um, we're going to be talking about an organization that we're a member of. It's called Bike Law USA. And Bike Law USA is a, an organization that uh, uh, was formed a number of years ago. Uh, and it's a, a group of attorneys, one for each state, that uh, is uh, tasked with representing cyclists in that state and acting as an advocate. Um, to help cyclists in that particular state. I happen to be the, the attorney that's been chosen to represent Pennsylvania, and it's uh, my job to represent cyclists, not just in bike crash cases, but also to, uh, to act as an advocate. Um, we're, we're, we're also going to be talking about um, the um, different types of bike crashes that occur all too often. We, we've all seen them. Uh, you've heard about them, you may have been involved in bike crashes uh, like this, but we're going to talk uh, predominantly about a few that uh, cause a lot of injuries to, to many cyclists uh, all too often. Um, and the, the last part, which I consider to be a, a very important aspect of what we're here to talk about, is um, a topic that might seem dry, but it's really important and it's really filled with some important information, and that's insurance law, and specifically the, the insurance that's available to all cyclists that's not known to most cyclists, and that's the, um, the insurance that is your automobile insurance, and people don't realize that one of the most important things that we as cyclists should really be concerned with is the type of automobile insurance we have, and we're going to talk about um, exactly what we should be looking for uh, in auto insurance. Um, a, a little bit more first about the, the first topic. Um, the first topic of uh, bike law itself. Um, Bike Law, as I said, is, is, a, is a group of attorneys around the U.S. that each represent a state, um, each of us being tasked with um, representing cyclists and being an advocate in our state. It started in 1998, a gentleman by the name of Peter Wilborn uh, unfortunately lost his brother to a bike crash accident and decided that he needed to do something with his profession to help cyclists and to to help minimize injuries and accidents. And uh, with that, um, bike law was, uh, was, uh, was formed. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we represent cyclists. We work on behalf of legal reform that helps cyclists. And um, what we're doing today, hopefully imparting a little bit of knowledge about how to avoid bike crashes and a little bit about um, what you need to think about before you even step foot on a bike, um, that had to do with the uh, insurance situation. Um, the, with that being said, um, what we're going to do is talk about some really unfortunate bike crashes that happen every day. Um, 
and a lot of people are injured. And we really believe that by being familiar with these types of incidents, you could really avoid a lot of them. And Arlie is going to talk a little bit about some of the most common bike accidents and how they occur. So, Arlie, you want to go over probably the most common? All right, again, my name is Arlie Kemmerer. I'm actually serving as of counsel with Joe at Piscatello Law. That I'm an attorney, I've been an attorney since, and in private practice um, since 2012. Um, my practice is based out of the Poconos, but now I'm sort of splitting my time between up there and with Joe at his practice in Old City. Um, I race bikes professionally, I've been racing bikes for 11 years now or something like that. Um, and Joe just skimmed right over my picture on this presentation. <laughs> but there's a picture That's of because I knew you could explain it much better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tell everyone a little bit about your racing career. Um, I've been, I raced cyclocross for the last 11 years, as a, well, give or take 11 years, but as a professional. Um, I've represented the United States at the World Championships in 2014 and have been taken to, uh, represented the U.S. in various World Cups since 2013. Um, still did World Cups up until last year, and this year, I forgot, I did World Cups this year, two months ago. Sorry, <laughs> yes, I did that too. Um, I am practice a lot at the same time. It gives me a lot of free time. Uh, so I'm going to present, Joe and I are actually going to trade off a little bit here about various kinds of um, bike crashes. There's a couple videos in here just to make the hair on the back of your neck stand up for today. We want that shock value. Um, the first thing, we call it the, the right hook. So this is a situation where... You're on the bike lane or you're on the shoulder and someone hangs a right hand turn and just hits you while you're just cruising along in a, in a, you're intending to go straight. This has actually happened to me. I've been hit on a bike twice in my life, both while I was in school, in law school and living in Washington, D.C. Uh, so this has happened to me. So this is a situation where you're right next to a car, car hangs a right, you don't know that that's coming. Um, so. I'm sure everybody in here would understand that you, as the cyclist, would have the right of way in that situation, similar to a car in that, in that particular situation. Um, but what the law is and what really ends up happening practically are, are two different things. Now, fortunately for me, when this happened to me, all I did was sort of lean on the car, and we both made a right turn. So I just made a right turn with the car. That didn't, wasn't planning to go that way, but that's what happened. I didn't crash. Driver drove off. Um, it was really scary, but it was okay for me, fortunately. Um, okay. I don't, how do, is this middle button to play it? Um, and is there sound? The sound really affects me, so. Yeah, we need to give it a shot. Do we need to do it on there? Yeah. I don't want to press button. Yeah. You could go to the next on, one, it might just automatically. We're lawyers, we're not IT people. We don't know how to do this. You raise a good point, and that was actually what one of the things, and I don't know if we have that on the next slide, but I personally, in practice, ever since, and it's probably ever since I got hit, or that happened to me, that if I see a car in front of me, I defer, I don't trust that they're going to have their turn signal on, um, and I defer to them just in case, because if I am side by side with them, and they hang that right hand turn, there's, there's nothing I can do. Now again, that doesn't make the, this, these cyclists at fault, but it's just more of like a best practice if you're trying to not get hit by a car. 
And may, maybe, I, maybe I could speak to that because unfortunately I have too much experience with that particular video. That's a client that I actually uh, represented in, in that case. And um, the issue that you're raising was, was actually raised in court. And uh, what, we, what we attempted to explain uh, in court was the fact that when you're, when you're on a bike and you're riding adjacent to vehicles, it's not really your job to gauge how fast they're going and stay the same speed as them, especially when you're coming to an intersection. If they put on their brakes, you're not necessarily going to put in your brakes. The bottom line is the bike is free to go a little bit faster or a little bit slower. But once again, that, that doesn't mean what the cyclist should have done. The cyclist is completely in the right here because the, the car should not have taken a right without checking in their mirror, or car, car is at fault. But as a practical matter, you should, you should always strive to not dispute who has the right of way when you're on a bike. You, you need to defer to the, to the vehicle and let them go. This cyclist just was not concentrating. He should have let the car go. He should have, assumed. we'll talk about that in a minute. I don't want to interrupt too much, but the point is, we're showing you common accidents, but there's ways of avoiding these common accidents. And, and the way of avoiding these common accidents isn't necessarily changing your speed, but we'll talk about that in a couple minutes, how this could be avoided. We're going to have time for questions, but because we have a very well-known attorney in the <laughs> audience here, John Bovante, well, if you have a question, also, I'm, going to, I'm going to let you ask Who, who also got the cream this summer in a, the right hook turn. But I think the, the uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, but I think the, what gives the cyclist the right of way under those circumstances is if you look there and you see the bike lane, that's like another traffic lane. So if you were to think of that as a, a, a car lane and you were driving in the center car lane and making a right-hand turn, you would never have the right of way as a car driver to just turn from the center lane across the right lane and make a right-hand turn. That bike lane is there for that cyclist, and the car has to respect it. So that's the legal principle. May I respond to that? We are ringers. We are both members of the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, Bicycle Technical Committee. I want to point out the solid striped white line. That motorist has no instruction to merge to the right before making his turn. This is a case where the facility has us arguing dysfunctionally about jelly beans. That bike lane should be dropped well before the intersection so every participant in traffic can pick his roadway position according to his destination at the intersection. Okay, that's, that's a good point. We're, we're, we're getting off topic a little bit here. We're, we're discussing who's right and wrong and how the infrastructure of the lane should be tweaked a little bit so as to afford vehicles a better opportunity to recognize that bikes are alongside of them. It's something we'll, we could talk about um, when we get through this, but uh, for the time being, let's, well, why don't we just move along, and then we'll have some, I would love to talk to you about that, because I have some ideas also. Um, but but uh, you're right, and that's, uh, that's something that we're addressing with something called Vision Zero and changing the infrastructure of the roadways. It's a great, it's a great point, and things do have to change in that respect. Okay, I'm going to do, just because, uh, one more question, and then we're going to move along, and then we're going to have... What, what, at what time did it become okay for what? For a bike? For, for turning into a bike lane. Oh, for turning it, the front it, lane. Didn't. it didn't. It's it didn't. Yeah. You it's, should be turning from the right most lane. Yeah, you're, 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 you, you, you have to wait until the area is clear, and then you, then you, then you could turn. Yeah, but but you, we'll, we'll get into it. Let's, okay. let's, let's take it up after we get through so we have more time to talk okay. about it. So... Another common accident, maybe not 
maybe not as common as, as the right hook, as we call it, is the, is the left cross, which, as you could probably imagine from the term, is a cyclist is driving, uh, riding down the road, and a vehicle coming in the other direction just decides to make a left-hand lane, a left-hand turn in front of you. They obviously didn't recognize there's a cyclist, and um, obviously the cyclist is concentrating on going forward. The vehicle obviously did not see a car coming, so it made its left-hand turn, and um, obviously the, uh, did you hit the center button? No, Andrew. Andrew. Um, it's hard to predict this is going to happen. You're bike riding down. <laughs> So, you know, you know, why are we, why are we showing such obvious situations of vehicles hitting cyclists? Um, the last vehicle, uh, the last video that you saw of the cyclist getting the right hook, it was driving in between the cars, and the gentleman asked, you know, why didn't he just stay the same speed? Why did he pass him? Um, the car slowed down. The car, the, yeah, you, you, the car slowed down, so he didn't, maybe he did, maybe he didn't realize that, but there is a way, this particular cyclist that I, I represented, he came to me because this was his um, third accident, and I, I know why he was involved in many accidents, because he has a, a GoPro, and I've seen all of them. Um, and he, and he said, Joe, is it me? Do I have like a cloud over my head or is it me? Am I doing something wrong? And um, I, I told him it's, it's not necessarily him, but really in actuality it is. And, but what I explained to him is, and this applies, and this, if there's anything you could take away from the seminar, this is, this is the one golden nugget that hopefully you could, you could pick up as a cyclist. When, when you're in any area where there are any vehicles that you could see, and I do this every single day that I, that I ride my bike, the vehicles that I could see to the left of me, I certainly don't check to see if they have a turn signal. I would be foolish to do that. I would assume that they're going to turn if they have a turn signal on. Every single vehicle that's to the left of me, I assume is going to turn into me. Every single one. Everyone coming in the opposite direction, I assume, didn't see me because I'm not as obvious as a vehicle, and I assume they're going to take a left into me. It's what you have to do as a cyclist, and you might think that's overly paranoid, you might think that's not fair, and maybe it is paranoid, maybe it's not fair, but I do a really good job at being avoided, being hit in Philadelphia every single day, at least... I would say I have to go across town at least four or five times per ride. I could be hit if I'm not paying attention because cars are cut, cutting into me. Every single vehicle you have to assume is going to turn into you. And so I told the gentleman that I represented, there's a trick to not being hit. I call it playing the game. And the game is how many cars could you count on every single ride that almost killed you? And the higher number you get, the better score you have. So you start fudging the data and you see a car sort of turning like, well, I kind of saw him, so I avoid it. So you could say that's one. But the point is you could actually pick out four, five, six, seven times per ride where you almost avoid an accident by totally avoiding it, obviously. But that's what you have to think as a cyclist. That's the type of defensiveness. I'm not saying that's right. I'm not saying that's the way it's always going to be. But it'll keep you from being hit. It keeps me from also being hit every day. Cross and all, and that video and all, you have to realize there were cars to the left of that cyclist and all going the same direction. So the motors turning left probably saw those cars, probably didn't see the cyclist because they might have been screened by those cars and all. As soon as they passed, oh, there's my window over to turn. Gun that accelerator. And that's why you heard that loud impact too, probably, because they were probably going very fast to complete that left turn before the next bit of traffic came. Never saw a cyclist in there. Absolutely. Last second. I've, I've, I've been in court with this exact case where the cyclist is riding down the road. They come to an, they come to an intersection. 
the people at the, there's no traffic control device, but the people at the intersection, because there's a lot of traffic backed up, will just stop to let cars make a left-hand turn in front of them. Good Samaritan. And, and the cyclist is coming down the side of the street. I actually represented a cyclist that was hit by a car making a left-hand turn, and the police officer wrote the ticket to the cyclist, the indicating the that the cyclist is definitely at fault because he proceeded with an inter through an intersection that was unsafe to proceed through because the car was making a left-hand turn. That actually, went, that actually went to court, and fortunately the judge explained to the police officer that the cyclist had the right of way, and even though the vehicle coming in the opposite direction was waved on by another motorist that it was it clear, it's like you're at fault. Well, if you can't see, you, you're not supposed to cut over. But once again, this, you might say the cyclist, how could the cyclist see the vehicle that's about to make a left-hand turn if there's, other, if there's cars obstructing his or her vision? Um, that's not the point. That's not the point. The point is you just need to always be aware that a car is going to cut in front of you. It's going to take a left-hand turn. Even if you can't see them, if you can't see them and they're obstructed by some other vehicle, you have to assume, just as though you're driving, riding your bike down the street and there's traffic backed up on Spruce or on Pine Street and you're passing vehicles to the right, do you know what you should be really aware of? Because I've Why been in an accident. Stop? Not I'm only they're all time. stopped, but guess what happens when vehicles are stopped? People crossing the street, not at the intersection, walk between them. I've had people walk in between cars that are stopped in traffic that I've hit. Right? So now I'm constantly checking to see if pedestrians are walking between cars. Sometimes I have to actually go a little bit slower, anticipating that they will be there. But it's something you have to do if you don't want to be killed as a cyclist. You have to do that. Or potentially kill a pedestrian. Or potentially, yeah, or potentially kill a pedestrian. You're right, you're right. Dooring. Um, has anybody ever been doored before? Okay. Um, I'm gonna let Arlie talk about dooring, but uh, there's some do's or don'ts if you're about to be doored. And let me just say one of them is, before we get into it, don't try to avoid the door by shooting out into the traffic. Yeah. Every time they it's, it's, it's like a deadly um, um, maneuver. You want to? Um, okay. Yeah, I'll get to this. So we live in Maniac and ride down Main Street in Maniac every day, and that's like that's like dooring roulette. I feel like, especially when school's back in session. Um, but again, I think everybody probably in here would probably assume that, or this wouldn't be a surprise that. Obviously, the driver has has the obligation to check before they open their door. Um, I don't know how often people actually do that, but it, that's what they are obligated to do. And so, again, if someone flings the door open in front of you, you smash into the door. They are, you know, the driver. The the car would be the one at fault in that situation. But um, and again, we're we're sort of highlighting these these situations as. What the, what the law provides to you, but then also what our general best practice would be to just avoid the situation in general. Um, so this one's a pretty simple one. Um, like I said, every time we drive through Main Street, ride through Main Street in Maniac, I'm like in the middle of the road because I just know it's, it's going to happen sooner or later. So, you know, you just want to try to avoid riding, riding in the door, as we're calling it here, the door zone, um, and just assuming when you're in a, in a place like Main Street in Maniunk, that there's going to be people getting in and out of cars with regularity. Um, and yeah, it's again, it's, it's, an, it's an anticipation of, of something that might happen. And while it, it may, again, to echo Joe, it may seem unfair that we are having to be more defensive and more attentive and all of those things, but ultimately it's not really about who's right or wrong when you're, when you're severely injured. Um, because at that point, you're injured. So yeah, we can hash out all day long who's at fault, but it doesn't really undo the injury that it's caused. So um, again, the idea, of the main, main takeaway there is if someone does fling the door open, I know it's really hard to not swerve, because I've done that before too, or I've swerved out of the way. And, but um, I don't know if it's very easy to think about that in that moment. But if you're traveling in, a, in that, in what we're calling 
the, or in that yellow zone of that photo right there, um, then the hope is you won't run into a problem. And, and again, on a street like Main Street in Maniac, that's a good example of this too, because the cars come up right next to you. So they're, they're like pushing you into what we would call the door zone here. I just keep cruising and I let them stay behind me because I just don't, I don't want this to happen. I think the greater likelihood of an injury in a place like that would be the doors and not the cars behind me. So that's the thing. Yeah, I, I see a brick median in that street and you hear motorists who emerge into that median and pass people riding on the sides of it. So, um, let, let, yeah. let's just, with regard to dooring, let's just take a different spin on dooring. Uh, Real quick. Yep. I read or heard that recently we're trying to teach young motorists to open the driver's door with their right hand. Yes. And then look over their yeah, left shoulder. Yeah, that, that's exactly what this is called. Sorry. The, if you had it. That's yeah, what I was you, gonna say. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Lee, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's something wonderful called the has anybody ever heard the Dutch Reach? Yeah, yes. Yeah. I mean the Dutch Reach is wonderful and it should be this is something that um, that we try to be uh, more involved in, and that is education of children that are just learning to drive. People should be taught the Dutch Reach. And for anybody that doesn't know what it is, if, if I'm in the driver's seat um, right here, the idea is to teach um, people that are learning to drive to never open with their left hand. The Dutch Reach... Uh, it teaches us to reach with the right hand, causing you to look before you open the door, instead of just opening and then looking. And it minimizes or, you know, it effectively helps the situation of not dooring people. If you, I mean, try to get in the habit of using your right hand if you're driving. Of course, the opposite would apply if you're, if you're a passenger. But they also have sharrow markings now in Manium, yes? On some of yeah, 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 yeah. They, so that you can do, as you say, take the lane. Yeah, yeah they do. Even though Absolutely, yeah, you're, 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 you're permitted to. You're right. permitted to ride in, in the middle of the road. Yep, you're right. And you, and you, and you should if you're too close to the vehicles. Can we, can we come back to that later? Uh, Absolutely. Because uh, there's laws about how wide the street is and, and where you have to be on the right as opposed to not. Not right. right. But but I need to know more about those. Pennsylvania law says nothing about lane width or shareability. So, um, I had the pleasure. I don't. Is he in here? I had the pleasure Joe of Stafford it. Left hand. You know who I'm talking about? Joe Stafford. Yeah. So, um, my worst nightmare uh, comes to fruition. I'm standing at our booth upstairs, and this gentleman says, "I want to give you a quiz <coughs> and ask you a question about the law." I wonder if you know the answer. And he cited some statute, some code, and I had to admit, I, I'm sure I'm familiar with what it talks about, but I don't know it by that number. And uh, he, he proceeded to tell me that he was the gentleman who, who drafted the bill that was eventually signed in Pennsylvania, giving us the four foot rule um, when you're passing a cyclist, you're supposed to give them four foot of clearance. Um, some states have no law on this. You could pass as close as you want. There are some states, right, that have two, two foot, but I think most that do have a law have, um, well, there's a statue right there to your reference. Um, <laughs> most have the three foot, the three foot rule. Um, we're fortunate, as, a, as an attorney, I practice law in, Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and Pennsylvania is not, a, is not a very progressive state. New Jersey has a lot of much more um, consumer um, protective statutes and thinking about the general public more, believe it or not. Pennsylvania ha it has a lot of archaic laws and they're not very progressive. To my surprise, and I learned why, but to my surprise, Pennsylvania is like, leading the, the way in, in the United States four foot, that's fabulous. The problem is, you know, how do you implement this? How do you, how do you cite people for this? It's not, it's not that, um, it's not that simple. Um, perhaps with education, motors will be a little bit more cognizant of 
the fact that how many pounds their vehicle weighs and that they're passing a cyclist with no protection, and they will give us more room. But uh, there are actually, um, very quickly, there, there are actually some states that are actually doing testing with um, um, uh, technology that's been developed to measure the distance as a car passes a cyclist, that they're mounting on bikes and testing certain roads to see what the general population is actually passing. And then they're going to try and figure out how do we actually enforce these rules for three foot or four foot, whatever it is. But it's in its infancy, but it's a start, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing for, um, for motorists to know that they should give us a little bit. I bet most motorists are unaware of that rule. I, yeah, I would say unless they're cyclists, right? Unless right. you're a unless cyclist, I don't, I don't think much. No, many people would know about. I've it. never seen like I've never seen that sign on the street. You must visit our website. You, you show them. Look at that. Yeah, we have it. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hold that up again? Here it is. <laughs> oh, they, they make them bigger. That's from my <laughs> That's unlimited. Okay, this is real, real quickly over this because I know we're running out of time and the most important stuff is coming up. Um, I used to think it wasn't cool to have lights on my bike. It's really cool to have lights on your bike. It's cool to make it home. A, a strobe light, a flashing light on the front, flashing light on the back. You, you know, you're not going to lose credit with being cool by having a light on your bike. It really helps. How many people in here ride with lights on their bike during the day? Yeah. If it's raining, or if it's snowing. Rise with them and turn them on. So yes. I can tell you as a practical matter that within the last year, I've started riding with a blinking taillight. And you're, and, a, and you're a professional and I'm cyclist. I'm a professional cyclist. And I will tell you that every time I turn it on during the day, people give me more space. It's weird. Yes. It is, it is surprisingly effective. I've had effective. motors thank me for really? having that flashlight That's great. because they, they stopped at a corner and said, you know, yeah. I didn't see you. Except that you had that flashing light, I saw That's you. Fabulous. And that front light is equally important during the mm -hmm. day. It a is. good flashing white light, the cars will see you, it yeah. will minimize conflict. It will Correct. minimize door. Real, real quick, back here before we get to yeah. this. Uh, just real quick, I want to slow you up, but if you're not familiar with Garmin Barrier Radar, check it out. Yeah. It's a lifesaver because it actually tracks cars up to $150 on a Garmin device. I don't know about other brand devices or if you use a phone that won't work with that. But it will actually show on your garment when the car is going up. It's a lifesaver. Oh, right. Which is really helpful for me. Like each individual car. So meaning like, you know, and it won't track cyclists. Usually every now and then it will. Usually yeah. the object is moving faster than you as well. It'll be a it little stop moving up. So you, you, even if you don't hear it, you can see it visually. And you get an audible alert. I know a number of people that use it and really like that. Uh, what's it called? Garment Barrier Radar? Um, this is like... This is like old tech, but a gentleman came up to me today and made a really good argument that um, there are these things called mirrors that they put on their helmet and their handlebars. And, you know, they, he made a really, he, he made a good argument. I didn't, I, I don't know that I'm going to put one on right away, but <laughs> when I stop worrying about being cool at all, I'm definitely going to start using one. One point for that, two things I'll never ride without, my mirror and my uh, very radar. But points they do actually make mirrors that for racing are great actually goes inside of your lens and not on the outside so you don't lose yeah points. i know what you mean yeah little tiny mirror that 360 pivot it goes right on inside your lens uh, so you don't get in trouble i would like to get something like that yeah, I mean, I like that. yeah. <laughs> okay let's get to um this is my favorite part this is really exciting to me because um this is what determines whether or not it could help somebody or not um so uh, insurance uh, and cyclists. First of all, I just, as, as a general rule, most people don't realize that if they're in a, a, a bike uh, crash, they don't realize that one of the most important things we have to look to is what your car insurance says, what you have on your car insurance. Um, and that goes not just for your medical bills, your medical bills by law have to be paid by your car insurance if you're in a bike accident. Um, most people think that, well, the other car caused the crash, they should pay for it. Ultimately, they will, but in our state, in Pennsylvania, you go to your car insurance, they pay the first $5,000 of your medical bills. Um, 
also, when you're on a bike, even though you're not operating a motor vehicle, if you're in a bike crash with a car, one of the most important ways of protecting yourself is to have what's called underinsurance and uninsurance. How many people have uninsurance? How many people are not sure what uninsurance is and underinsurance? Okay, more than half of the people. So this is the most important thing as a cyclist that you need to, this is one of those things you have to take away, if anything, from, um, from this uh, short lecture. If you're in a bike crash, chances are that the person that struck you and caused the accident, probability-wise, statistically, they're going to have coverage that protects you to the tune of $15,000. That might seem like a lot of money to some people, but if you have multiple broken bones, if you have an injury with your head, if you can't work for a period of time, $15,000 goes away before you get out of the emergency room. If they call a trauma alert for you, you could have a medical bill of $50,000 like that. So, in a bike crash, you could be completely protected if your car insurance includes uninsurance and underinsurance. That's a portion of your policy that if the other person hits you, doesn't have enough insurance or doesn't have any insurance, you're gonna be protected because you were financially responsible enough to realize, chances are, if you're in a crash, the other person won't have sufficient insurance. You go to your own insurance policy, and your own insurance policy will pay for your damages, whatever they are. So what I encourage everybody that I spoke to here today thus far is call our office. We don't charge for this. Let us know what kind of policy you have. You could fax us. You could email us your policy. And we'll point out exactly what underinsurance is and uninsurance. And we'll talk about what kind of coverage you should have. It's depending on what you could afford, but it's really important. Shouldn't our insurance brokers know all that? Or they're not equipped to really that's a, do the details? Yeah, that's an, ex, that's an excellent question. They should, they should know about that. And they should tell you about that. And even if they don't tell you about it, by law, when you buy car insurance, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania mandates that whoever, if State Farm is set, selling you a policy, they have to give you under insurance and uninsurance at the same level that you're purchasing what we call your liability insurance. That's the part of your insurance that pays the other person. They have to give it to you. The only way you don't have it is if you sign a form saying, I don't want it. I know, I ha I know that I'm supposed to be offered, but I don't, I don't want it. And you give it up. Why would, a, why would an insurance agent ever do that to you? Anybody have any ideas? No, no attorneys, please. <laughs> One rational explanation is if they think you're a high risk. No. No? No. No. They could, they could, no. Their, their, their livelihood depends on selling premiums. Right. The selling policies where they make money on your premium. So if you're selling, if you're an agent and you sell somebody under insurance, they get paid maybe $20, $30 more. They just sold a policy. Every time it renews, they make a little bit of money, right? So you would think, why would an insurance agent not sell you under insurance? Well, the law terms, I mean, and the risk is greater than where is he saying? Um, so if you do have an accident, now they got to pay out all this money. And your premium's not going to cover that. Okay. The agent doesn't pay for it. The agent is a representative of State Farm or Nationwide. There's a very simple reason. When people buy insurance, they learn that it's very expensive, especially if you live in a city, right? Insurance agents compete for business with other insurance agents. Insurance companies, even if you don't have an agent and you go online and you purchase a policy, they're competing with other companies. It really helps if they can offer you a product that costs less. So what they do is they just exchange, they just sell more policies. They could give you a policy that costs less. They tell you, don't worry, you're protected. You have everything you need to have under the law, and you're only paying X thousand dollars per year, and you buy the policy. But the problem is, if you're in an accident, you're screwed. So the insurance agent would actually make more money if they sold you a more expensive policy, but you know, it's better to sell the policy 
and have somebody else sell it. What do you? Go ahead. Say, you didn't ask. It's me. just quick. Um, this is really good to know, and it's valuable for me because I. But what have if a you car. don't have a car? What if you don't have a car? Uh, and there's you're, a lot of cyclists who don't have a car. Yeah, you're. Um, well, then you should practice some of the tips that I taught you about uh, <laughs> avoiding <laughs> accidents. Yeah, yeah. There's actually, you can actually go out and buy insurance if you don't have a vehicle to like pay your, some of your medical bills and your, the damage to your bike. We looked at that, Rachel, right? I sent you a link on that the other day. Um, but I haven't found anything that protects you like under insurance, uninsurance. <clears throat> One more question. How come you don't mention full torque versus partial torque and why you should have full torque there? Uh, I didn't get to it yet. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Yep. Yep. Sorry, so, um, under insurance and uninsurance is what we're talking about. If you have a policy, remember the insurance agent wants to sell, sell you the policy. They don't want to charge you too much or you'll go to another carrier. They should offer you and by law, they have to give you something called full tort. Full tort is a type of policy that if you're in an accident, if you have a crash, you could make a claim against the other person for your pain and suffering. If you have limited tort, you can't make a claim against the other person for your pain and suffering. Even though it, they, the other person caused the accident and they're fully insured and they have full tort, you can't make... Now, there are exceptions, and your agents will tell you. If you're in a really bad accident and you have really bad injuries, don't worry. It doesn't matter if you have full tort or limited tort. The truth of the matter is, if you have limited tort, you're greatly, greatly restricted in what you can do. So you have to have full tort. Everybody should have full tour. Nobody should have limited tour. Is this just the Pennsylvania law, or is this applicable in all states? If this is a Pennsylvania, this is a Pennsylvania law. It actually started like 25, 30, no, 35 years ago in Michigan when they developed um, a threshold law, they called it in Michigan, and it was what turned into limited tour. So there's various states in the United States they call it different things, but there's full tort and limited tort. In New Jersey, they call it the legal threshold, but it's very similar to full tort and limited tort in Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm so, from Massachusetts. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what Massachusetts is, but I would, I would venture to say they probably have something that they're willing to sell you so that you can't make a claim in the future if you're in a, in a bad accident. But you're I don't just talking about pain and suffering, right? This is independent of the issue. The other guy's fault. His insurance company is going to pay for the damages to your car, correct? Right. Independent yeah. Independent of the tort. Exactly. So if you have limited tort, um, good point. If you have limited tort and and you're on your bike and the other and, and the vehicle breaks your bike or damages it, even though you have limited tort, they still have to fix it. If you have lost wages, if you have medical bills that have not been paid, like you have more bills than your insurance pays for, the other side still has to pay for it. When we talk about full tort and limited tort, we're talking about your ability to make a recovery through the pain and suffering. So that's why you need full tort for pain and suffering. Where does your regular health insurance come into play? Your so, car insurance, health insurance? Yeah, so, so in, in Pennsylvania, and I'm sure there's differences in other states, but in Pennsylvania, we have what's called a priority system, and depending on the circumstances, oftentimes when somebody's injured, there are various insurance policies that are potentially at play, but there's a priority of who goes first and who goes second. If you're in an auto-related accident, the priority dictates that your auto insurance pays the first portion, typically 5000 <coughs> then your personal health insurance comes into play. If you're in an accident in a car and you're in the scope of your employment, your auto insurance doesn't pay. Your workers' compensation it takes a priority and they pay first. So oftentimes, one policy pays in a car situation. When that's, we call it exhausted, when the policy is used up, the $5,000, then your personal insurance comes into play. Okay. 
One more question. The other car is completely at fault, and you have a million dollars in medical bills. You forget about pain and suffering. Are they required to pay that? Um, well, you know, the devil is always in the detail. We have to have we have to know more about your scenario. If you have health insurance, personal health insurance, and all of your bills have been paid for but a portion of them have not, because your insurance only paid, like, say, 80%, that portion that has not been paid, the other side has to pay for. And even though your own health insurance paid for 80% of your million dollars, people don't realize this, but your personal health insurance, whenever they pay a bill, there is a company out there that is reviewing every bill that's paid by insurance <coughs> and they're looking for anything that's trauma-related. If they see anything trauma-related, they think to themselves, wow, this person may have been in an accident. And if they're in an accident, they might have an attorney. And if they have an attorney, that person might sue somebody or make a claim. So they have what we call a subrogation interest. What that means is whenever you're hurt, you could be in a slip and fall, you could be in an auto accident. Anytime you're injured, if your personal insurance pays, whatever they pay, if you make a recovery against somebody and the money's coming to you, you can't take that money. You have to pay it back to your own insurance company. Not all of it, but a portion of it. So whenever we settle a case on behalf of somebody, we always look at whatever was paid by their personal health insurance and we ask ourselves, do we have to take some of the money that's coming in and give it back to Aetna? Do we have to give it to Blue Cross Blue Shield? And we take it. The point of that is we figure out, it's called a lien. Your personal health insurance company has a lien. It might be 5,000, it might be 30,000. We take that lien and we say, ah, that's a $30,000 lien. When we negotiate with the insurance company on the other side, we explain, uh, we've got a $30,000 lien. So even if you gave us 50,000, my client would never see any of it because you have $30,000 you have to pay for it before my client would even be compensated at all. So whatever, to answer your question, you have a million dollars in bills, some of it is going to be paid by the other side, the portion that's unpaid and the portion that there's a lien on. It's probably a longer explanation. Now, but it's, it's um, what, am I, what am I missing here? Financial, why, do, why do I need auto insurance? That's a, that's a problem. It's like this without vehicles. They're, they're in a bad situation. They're in a very bad situation. But you could, um, like I said, there are policies. If you Google it, you'll see insurance for cyclists. But it's not the same as auto insurance, and um, there's no substitute for having the right policy. There's millions of millennials without cars, without car insurance. <laughs> You're right. And that's why if they, if they are hit, um, hopefully the person that hit them has proper insurance. It's not like you completely lose if you don't have a car. Your own insurance is like a backup. It's just like a fail-proof mechanism. It's like an insurance policy. Yeah. <laughs> in, in the event there's no insurance company on the other side. Um, any questions? Yeah. I've heard whisperings of policies being made, made available so you don't have cars to provide that. No, no. But I know, I know that I've been told it exists. Um, and you're talking about, like I said, th there are policies that I've seen that pay for your, if you're a cyclist and you're hit by a vehicle and they don't have enough insurance, they pay for, your insurance poly policy pays for your medical bills, pays for your bike that's been damaged, um, and could even pay for your lost wages, but not for pain and suffering. Have you seen those policies? Well, I've heard, this may be the lot that's monster sighting, but you know, I think I've heard somebody say, oh yeah, we know a lot of instances now you've talked about it, but I don't remember yeah. the conversation. I'm in the about. business and I'm having a hard time finding it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a real need for all these millennials yeah. without cars. <coughs> and you, sh you should sell those policy to those guys with a venom up. I mean, they were, those people should all have that coverage. Yeah, I think it's really here and then here. startling that uh, somebody hasn't stepped into the breach and introduced full insurance. Because it's really a, it's becoming... Yeah, I actually, um, 
my, my wife uh, made the recommendation that I call one of my clients who owns several um, Allstate agencies. I'm friends with these people that have these insurance agencies, and I called them and I, and, and, and I said, um, look, um, do you sell policies for cyclists that don't have vehicles? And he said, no, never heard of it. He said, but can I give you a recommendation? He said, what, Joe, why don't you Google it? I said, thanks, Lou. And I, and I did, and I came up with the one that I showed you, Rachel. I, cu I couldn't find anything that paid for. I think it would be a good, a, a great product. And maybe, maybe it will become a product with the advent of more people cycling. Maybe there's some, John, you had a question? Well, I was just, and I, you kind of get lost in the weeds with some of this stuff, and I know you have other things to address, but um, the... John, healthcare. since you're a friend, don't ask me any hard questions. No, but wouldn't the health care... Uh, bills be paid by your own personal health care insurance if there's no auto insurance. That would just become priority <clears throat> rather than secondary payment. And then with your yeah, bicycle, correct. Like if your bicycle is damaged, typically that's actually not paid by the auto insurance. It's actually paid, it can be paid by the contents insurance of your homeowner's policy and so if you're a renter, even, and you don't own a home, you can get renter's insurance, and your bicycle may be covered through that. But there's a lot of, like, little twists like this, and, it, yeah, these issues get very confusing. Like, when you were talking about insurance, I started thinking of ERISA, and you can really, like, your head can explode with yeah. some of these legal so issues. The, yeah, so, the, I mean, the, the, the bottom line is the, the, the person that caused the accident is responsible for all these things. We're simply talking about what if the person that caused this mm -hmm. accident yeah, George, is with them. Right. And obviously, if you have car insurance, that's going to pay your medical bills. If you don't, then it goes, like John said, it goes to your personal <clears throat> insurance. Just like if you tripped walking out of here, you would go to your personal health insurance. And, uh... Me? Yeah, so if you're, if you're done with your presentation, so we're talking insurance. Um, something's bound to happen. I ride the Scooble uh, River Trail almost every day. Mm -hmm. Something, it's an accident waiting to happen. What are our rights on the trail, even if I were to hit someone? What are our rights? Yeah, rights okay, on so, trail? okay, so once again, it, circumstances mean something. There's different fact scenarios. So when you say, when something happens, I have a close friend that was on the Schuylkill River Trail and a vehicle um, came off of Kelly Drive and hurt him badly. What happens there? The vehicle is at fault. The vehicle takes responsibility for it. The driver is at fault, right? Yes. I mean, yeah. Did I, I said the vehicle, not the vehicle. The, dri the driver of the car is at fault. Um, I have cases in which pedestrians were walking on the trail and they're hit by cyclists. Um, any scenario that you could think of where somebody is injured, there are, in the law, there are common um, concepts of what we say called common law negligence that apply. So you would have to ask yourself, if you're injured, did the person that injured you have a duty of care that they breached that caused you damages? And it sounds like law school, but... In every type of collision, every type of injury matter, it's different depending on the circumstances. Sometimes the other person is at fault when you get hurt. Sometimes you're at fault when you get hurt. So it's it's fact specific as we would say. Um, I'm curious. A lot of the you're welcome to answer these questions. Sort of group causes a lot of these questions seem to be design based, and I'm curious. Yes. And, yeah. and are you like consultant on anything? Yeah. Are you like, do I represent any X Y Z cases in this? Yeah. So, so, does anybody? Is, what are the outcomes? <laughs> the what outcomes, the outcomes are, are are a work in progress. Mm -hmm. It's vision zero is what you're alluding to, maybe knowingly, maybe unknowingly. So, vision zero is something is a is a program that. Philadelphia has adopted and they have a goal that by the year 2030 will be zero 
fatalities of pedestrians and cyclists. So and severe injuries. And, and severe injuries, correct. Um, and that process that we go through takes many different forms, right? There are some proponents of bike paths that have some type of barrier and separation. Um, there are proposals for speeding or speeding cameras to bring the speeds down on certain roads. Red light cameras is part of it. Um, there are also, uh, I went to a Vision Zero conference and an engineer uh, gentleman that was seated next to me introduced me to a concept that I never heard of before which made so much sense. And that was when you're at a stoplight and you're a cyclist and you're proceeding straight or you're a pedestrian going in the same direction, when the light turns green, it should not turn green for you, the pedestrian and the motor vehicle. If you all go at the same time, you bump into each other, especially when one's taking a right-hand turn, right? So just by a small tweak that costs money, a small tweak to the lighting system, you could actually give a green light to a cyclist and a pedestrian just like four or five seconds, just to get them out and start, especially if they're not young and they take longer to cross the street, gives them an opportunity to start. And then the vehicle oh, will get yeah. the green light and less of a chance of a collision. I mean, these are all part of what Philadelphia and a lot of other cities are working on, striving toward reducing. That's what you're talking about is LTI, leading pedestrian interval. There's also, um, what they call pedestrian only interface, which is where the traffic in one direction gets their green light, the traffic in the other direction has their red light. Then it switches, the traffic gets the green light going the other way, and the traffic, you know. So the, in other words, cars go one way, cars go the other way, and then all cars stop, and it's green light yeah. all the way around for yeah. pedestrians and cyclists. Yeah. And that's you can, you that's can cross the street yeah. on a diagonal in that situation. So you can cross just the on the right side, side, you want to get to the other side. You don't have to go like this and make your L shape. You can cross diagonally because all the cars are stopped all the way around. I've seen it in action. In it's a lot wonderful. Of it's it's the idea behind Vision Zero to actually change the infrastructure yeah. Yeah. Of, uh, yeah. of our cities to yeah. reduce uh, injury. Yes. Um, what? Oh, yeah, you. Okay. you know. um, we're going to see, and we are already seeing, significant changes about to become dramatic changes in the uh, composition of the, the different categories of vehicles on the road. We're now seeing electrically assisted bicycles, electrically powered scooters, cars that have uh, automatic uh, sensing of, of obstacles and automated braking. And in probably 20 or 30 years, most cars will be um, automatically controlled with, with driverless cars. Can you? I know this is a this is a, a it's topic an interesting we really topic. don't know the answers to yet, but maybe you do have some. Uh, what what does that look like? Well, but it looks it's a wonderful thing because people like me won't have a job. It's, it'll be wonderful because when when there is more autonomy, there will be less crashes when vehicles are autonomous, I believe that. But, but on the other hand, we're seeing this rash of crashes with the e-scooters. So, yeah, that's so not autonomous, know. that's a whole different issue. Right. Yeah, yeah, there's, um, you know, technologies like that in their infancy, things have to be, you know, the bugs have to be worked out. There has to be legislation implemented. There's the same problem with um, e-bikes, um, pedal assisted versus having a throttle. There's different regulations that still have to control those scenarios. It's it's in its infancy. And it's, you know, it's, the laws have to develop on that. Unfortunately, people have to get killed. Speaking of which, can we get back to, at some point to my original question about the right turn? If you remind me of it, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the whole thing well, where the woman was killed is she was killed by a truck she had the right of way, technically, but my question, the thing that's really been gnawing at me ever since her death, 
is that everyone's knee-jerk reaction is, well, you know, no, that terrible truck driver didn't see her, you know, or wasn't careful enough. And, and I, I, I don't have any dispute with that. Mm -hmm. But how did we get to the point, I mean, in cars, if you take the bicycles out of the equation, you can't make a right turn in, from the left lane. Although the Philadelphians do it in cars, you know, every two seconds, mm -hmm. and no one stops them. But you, you can't do that, right? As Your question is, you can't take you can't a right-hand turn from a left lane. Right. Yeah. And so now, a vehicle, you, you're right. You're with right the bike right. lanes, it's like without a lot of discussion that I knew about, or, you know, it was just immediately presumed that this was going to be a tenable thing to say that, you know, bikes have the right way, the right way, even in the right lane, and they don't have to be uh, careful of cars. I mean, your, your, your underlying premise is absolutely incorrect. No, nobody ever said that cyclists in a bike lane can proceed with thinking that they don't have to worry about vehicles. That's the whole point of what we're talking about. Cyclists that do that are at risk, a higher risk. Right. You do have to. You're, you're saying that, but I mean, the reaction to some of these accidents it was, was that the cyclist wasn't, you know, that it was all the, the car drivers. Well, the, the reason is because some of the people that said it was all the truck drivers' fault had more facts than we're talking about. For instance, there was a videotape that clearly showed that the truck driver didn't put a turn signal on and was traveling at a high rate of speed. Some of these facts leaked out to the public, and a lot of public impression about the truck driver being at fault is based on that. Okay. Um, that's... That's one of the reasons why people were up in arms about what a terrible. So, so in, just to conclude, do you think that it's a tenable thing, though, the way the bike lanes are designed on screws and pine? Um, you know, that's such a loaded question. Do I think it's a tenable thing? Um, in, in a perfect world, um, they're highly dangerous. The way they are, they should be separated by some type of barrier. You should not have cars going 35, 40 miles per hour up against a bike lane. So is it, um, is it tenable? It could so, be improved. Right, improved. I mean, one of the things that, in, in, again, with a car only situation, you're expected to get in the right lane before you turn. Well, there's sections of spruce that are, the blocks are pretty short, and there isn't any dotted line. There's no, I would say most motorists have no idea that they're even supposed to try to get Correct. into the bike lane before they turn. Yeah. And the law is not clear. I don't hear people talking about it or, or adding to any kind of clarity about that. Right. Well, there are, there are people in the community and there are organizations in the community that recognize the problem, the issue that you're raising, and they're actually asking themselves, how could we educate motorists to recognize that there are bike lanes and we need to take certain precautions, and this is something that will change with, with time. We, you know, we, we want to figure that problem out. We do understand that there are some poor motorists that don't even realize there's a bike lane. Maybe they don't see it because it's not painted um, bright enough or it's worn out. Back here and then here. Should we all be riding around with video cameras that we could use to recommend it? Yeah. Um, well, let me, let me say this. Joe and I talk about this all the time. Um, it's, it can be helpful, obviously, because the more information you have, if you're filing a case, if you're in a lawsuit, the more evidence you got, the better, always. However, it's just you have to be mindful that that video camera is recording what you're doing, too. So you can't blow through a stop sign and then be like, but someone hit me, because that's going to be on there. Now, we just, Joe and I did a podcast recently, which I'm, I'm thinking is going to come out in the next week or two with one of my sponsors, actually. He was gathering up a bunch of uh, bike law attorneys in, across the country to sort of put one episode together. And we talked a lot about this. And I think, um, you know, you, you really need to, you need to be aware that it can catch you doing something that you don't want it to catch. And Well, and that's what we went into. There's, if yeah. we could do that's a whole good. civil procedure treatise for you. But yes, it, it, we, there's ways to request during the pendency of litigation that certain segments of a video be precluded because they're too prejudicial. So if, it, if a mile down the road you blew a stop sign, but then you got hit later on, 
is that really relevant? Is it too prejudicial? But it's up to a judge. They get paid more than us to, to make the decisions that we are bound bound by. So if a judge says, nope, sorry, I'm going to let it in. So only, so as a, as a plaintiff's attorney, you're always arguing just to give them the bare bones piece of the film that you think represents a nice argument that the other person did wrong. In this lawsuit that went before a panel of arbitrators, they found my client partially at fault, reduced the award by like 30 or 40 percent in this video. Does anybody know why? Where's the video? In this fight? Because it looked like he was riding between the, the car and the park car. Yeah, they thought he was crazy when they when they viewed the video from here. And I, I didn't allow the arbitrators to see the video that took place a minute earlier. <laughs> but when they saw just this little piece, he's yeah. in between a vehicle, and they're like, Joe, this guy's like, he's crazy. He's going 20 miles. I, you know, I, I had a similar response. What's he supposed to do? And they said, well, he's crazy. He shouldn't be riding there. Well, I think also that was the in, response. But so, Joe, isn't that, isn't, didn't they think he was going too too fast? Too so the optics of this make it look right. like this person was traveling at some high rate of speed for the intersection, but but it it can't gauge it proportionately because the cars aren't moving fast because there's traffic. But the good news is we appealed it. And we got everything. <laughs> I just want to get that in. <laughs> <laughs> but it did concern me when I saw what he was doing. I was like, whoa! Yeah. The, the, it looks worse. Yeah. It, it looks yeah. worse on but, the video in this case than right. it does. It's impractical. I, impractical. I think I, I think it's helpful to have cameras. I do think it could come back to haunt you. And the consensus amongst the attorneys that do that are members of Bike Law, we are running into similar situations that I ran into because some cyclists um, appear to be taking chances. So one more question, you have to wrap it up. Okay, one more question, I have to wrap it up. That guy has had his hand back up forever. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Uh, I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. I don't mean to you talked a lot about um, incidents involving vehicles. I'm curious to know, and if I apologize if you missed this before I got in here, but there was a case that I heard about out in California where a cyclist on a group ride with a whole bunch of other people went down in an accident, not because of vehicles, but because of other cyclists and or his own error. Now, he in turn sued the ride leader, the organization that put on the ride, etc. So I'm curious as to what your insights are. What, once again, whenever somebody makes an allegation that somebody did something wrong, they have to have a theory behind it. And the theory that you're alluding to is what we call a negligence theory. And if somebody brought suit against a group leader, in effect what they're saying is the group leader had a duty to make sure this incident didn't happen, and they either did something that they should not have done, or they didn't do something that they should have done. In other words, let's say the group leader says, hey, this is a really big hill, a case of beer for the first person that makes it down and they all race down the hill. That's not a really responsible group leader, right? So maybe that person should have been sued. On the other hand, maybe the group leader didn't do anything wrong. Somebody gets injured and they're just pointing the finger at the group leader. So it really, the, the bottom line is the facts matter. The facts, the circumstances matter. That determines whether or not you could make a valid claim. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, let me just mention that to thank you, and it's really crucial for you, is to ask the question, what can we do for you if we're in an accident? What do we need to know right at that moment? So I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I might not understand what you're what Well, I mean, if we had an accident, how can we help you? Ah. What do you need from us? Yeah, you know what? Great question. We thought that we thought people should know exactly what you're asking. Up on our, up on our table, right, 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 right here, we have like a little, you take a card and it tells you things, do's and don'ts, what you should do if you're in a bike crash, who you should contact, what you should do. Um, Don't post on Facebook or anything. Okay, okay. I'm getting. We're done. We have to close. Up. We have to close up. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.